Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar Enabling Reactivity Catalysis from Bench to Bulk presented by Dr John Wen, the Business Development Manager at Merck. Now my name is Jenny McShane and I am the Marketing Specialist for Australia and New Zealand for laboratory and specialty chemicals. Now for a little bit of housekeeping, now all participants are automatically muted by the administrators. Now please type any questions that you have using the chat feature. Now this webinar will be recorded and will be provided uh, to you later. There will be a Q&A session uh, will be and this will be held at the end of the presentation. So a little bit of background now of, about the speaker and the moderator. Dr. Wen has conducted research on photo uh, redox catalysis as a PhD student with Professor Corey R.J. Stevenson at the University of Michigan and on polydium catalyzed cross coupling as a postdoctoral fellow with the well known Professor Steve Buckwald at MIT. Now he joined Merck in 2018 as a business development manager in the life science business. In collaboration with the R&D department, he has developed and executed strategies for novel processes for the manufacture of ligards and pre-catalysts. We also, you can see there, is Karen Diong. Karen is our field and application specialist who is located here in Australia. And you may have already met Karen. Now I'd like to hand it over to you, John. Thank you, Jenny, for that kind introduction. Um, I want to start by just kind of giving an overview of the agenda that we're going to cover. Uh, there's a lot of information and hopefully we'll get a chance to cover everything um, in the time that's allotted. But what I want to do is start off with kind of giving an introduction to catalysis in general and then moving into how catalysis and drug development are intimately tied together. And at the end of the presentation, hopefully what I'll be able to do is provide a sense for how Merck uh, goes beyond just providing catalysis products, but our support services and our resources that go into uh, helping any chemists, whether they're in drug development or not, uh, to kind of further their endeavors for catal catalysis reactions. So I'll start off with an introduction and just to provide a very um, simple introduction, I'll just quickly define catalysis as uh, a substance that we are going to add into a chemical reaction and this typically will affect the reaction rates, um, hopefully in a positive way, uh, by lowering the activation energy, uh, but also regenerate that same substance so it's not consumed in the reaction. So a very simple, um, simple diagram here shows kind of this uh, definition in a illustrative way. Um, the key things to take away from our understanding of catalysis and and for a more in-depth understanding of catalysis is that you are really just affecting the kinetics of the reaction. You're never really affecting thermodynamics. And so your starting point and your end point stay the same. Uh, what you're actually doing is kind of lowering your activation energy and getting to the end point in a more efficient way. Um, if we look at all the catalysis uh, studies as well as the commercial catalysts that we are working with, uh, we normally are looking for things that make the reaction run more mildly, uh, provide a better sense of selectivity, uh, higher reactivity, and uh, because green chemistry is always a, a great goal to shoot for, a better atom economy. And then if we want to kind of differentiate our types of catalysts uh, into broad uh, categories, we have heterogeneous catalysts, homogeneous catalysts, and biocatalysts. So going beyond simply looking at the concept of catalysis, we can look into why catalysis is so important for modern It plays a large role in our economics. It plays a large role in how we're able to produce and manufacture. And most importantly, it is one of the key ways that we'll be able to continue sustainability into the future as it is one of the 12 green principles. If we shift our attention from uh, kind of the use of these catalysts to the size of the global catalyst market, uh, we find that it's a very lucrative area of, uh, of the economy. And in fact, uh, it is valued as of 2019 just below $30 billion. 
and set to increase to over $40 billion in the next seven years. If we look at it in terms of segments, uh, heterogeneous catalysis actually dominates the market at 73% uh, of the market share. Uh, but for today and for the ones that we'll be focusing on, which are homogeneous catalysts, that only focuses about 27% of the market share. And even a smaller amount kind of goes into API synthesis, but you'll see that it's a very important aspect of where catalysis is applied to. And then if we look into regions, uh, APAC, uh, Asia Pacific and China, as well as North America, make up the majority uh, for the catalyst global market. And, and just as a uh, point to note here, uh, when we refer to the global catalyst market, this refers to anything from catalytic converters all the way to uh, small molecule synthesis using homogeneous catalysts. So to better understand how catalysis plays a role into the chemical industry, um, what I've done here is I've broken down uh, the chemical industry into six subsectors. Um, what you'll notice here is that the basic and commodity chemicals uh, actually acts as the feedstock for the remaining five areas of the chemical uh, industry. Uh, for today's uh, discussion, what we'll be focusing on is actually the use of the fine chemical subsector uh, with the application of catalysts from the specialty chemical subsector to generate compounds that are most relevant to the life sciences subsector. In this case, we're focusing on API molecules that eventually are then converted to uh, drugs through various formulations. So if the question uh, then comes to how are these uh, fine chemicals actually converted into these life science specific molecules, uh, you actually then uh, go into this area here of the top catalyst reactions and types that are used for API synthesis. Um, unfortunately, we're not gonna have enough time to go into depth uh, for each of these catalyst reactions. I'll only have enough time to kind of show you some of the top uh, applications as well as a little bit of introduction to the main areas. Um, but there are certainly experts within Merck, including myself, that could give a much more in-depth and full one-hour seminar into any of these uh, catalytic areas. So now I think there's a poll question um, that will be provided. There will be a, I think i given a two-minute, three-minute time frame for that poll to take place. Continue, John. Thank you. Okay. It comes up. All right. So, all right. So, before we actually go into providing uh, the examples in which catalysis is used for specific API synthesis, I think the pertinent thing to do would be to start with understanding and providing context through the uh, description of the drug development process itself. So, what I provided on this slide is a summary of uh, the drug development timeline and cost. And so typically, uh, drug development is an extremely time intensive and cost intensive process. Uh, if we focus in on where that time and money is mostly concentrated, we actually find that the clinical trials uh, take up a bulk of the cost and the time. Um, this isn't surprising uh, because safety is an important aspect, an extremely important aspect to bringing out any new drug or treatment into the market. And so there needs to be a lot of time uh, and care uh, for that to take place. Um, I think the general public has kind of been made more aware of the drug development process ever since COVID-19 and all of the uh, news articles about uh, different companies going after different treatments and, uh, and different vaccines. And there's been a lot of, uh, of discourse regarding um, 
the benefits of trying to increase that time frame or decrease the timeline. Um, but just to make it very clear, um, it, it's very important for these drugs to be tested uh, effectively through clinical trials so that we are aware of any possible side effects. And those are not then uh, transmitted to the public um, without any indication whatsoever that that could take place. When we look at specific uh, drugs that are from small molecules, uh, we can actually then divide how the API synthesis is broken into uh, stages for the synthesis of the API. And we can allocate those stages with the different drug development stages. So for instance, in the lead compound identification stage, the key focus for medicinal chemists is to generate um, as many compounds that would be uh, the most active toward the target. And in this case, since you are trying to generate a large uh, library of compounds, the consideration for catalysts really focuses in on reactivity. What are the best catalysts that I can find to do the process uh, that would help generate the API? Um, cost, the catalyst loading, these aren't things that are uh, focused on at the beginning because we just want to see if reactivity, in most cases, actually, uh, there's been stoichiometric use of the catalyst just to see if the active compound can be generated. Once you move from lead compound identification to medicinal chemistry, uh, you're then starting to screen certain catalysts uh, and screen certain compounds uh, that have the best uh, viability within the body. And so in that case, um, this is now going to uh, change the concerns of catalysis from simply one of reactivity to catalyst loading and selectivity. Um, are you generating one uh, compound in your reaction? Or are you generating six different compounds? Uh, do you have to try to make sure that you're uh, purifying your, your reaction so you can get that single uh, important API? And uh, are you having uh, the ability to purify out the metal, if you're using a metal catalyst, the metal impurities because this can affect the viability of that drug candidate? And so as you move down the line, uh, different concerns start to take place and different priorities start to change. Uh, it's only actually when you get to the production stage during the clinical trials, does cost and scalability actually become the top priority? But at this point, um, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're doing the process as effectively as possible. And then the question is, uh, are you able to find a supplier or even make the catalyst uh, most efficiently in terms of price in-house or through some third-party manufacturer? Um, and then when you get to the final stage, actually, the most important aspect is to just make sure uh, that whatever supplier you're using and whatever catalyst you're using and whatever synthetic protocol you're using generates consistently the same product every time. And even if there is an impurity, that that impurity stays within a very strict um, uh, you know, error, error for margin. And so, as you can see, catalysis is tied in essentially into the whole drug development uh, process. Uh, barring the first two steps, which you're really focusing on finding the target. So now that we have established how uh, catalysis and drug development are uh, intimately tied together, I think uh, it's a good time to now start kind of talking about the common catalyst areas, common catalysts that are used in the medicinal chemistry and process chemistry for APIs. So out of that list that I showed previously for the common types of uh, catalyst reactions uh, used for API synthesis, I would mark the four uh, reactions here, uh, hydrogenations, cross-coupling, metathesis, and asymmetric catalysis as the top reactions uh, when we're talking about API synthesis. So I'll start off with hydrogenation. Um, in this case, the definition of hydrogenation which I'm sure most of you are aware, with, aware of, is simply adding a uh, indirect or direct source of hydrogen to an unsaturation to form a saturated compound. This can be a double bond uh, where it's a carbon-carbon, carbon-oxygen, carbon-nitrogen, or it can be a carbon-triple bond uh, alkyne type of molecule. And in most cases, you're using some metal catalyst. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, heterogeneous catalysts are 
are the most prominent of catalysts, and this is definitely the case for hydrogenation. Most of the time, uh, heterogeneous catalysts are what's used for hydrogenation. Uh, but for, for this example here, um, I want to talk about homogeneous catalysts um, as it's become more and more prominent in the field. And so it's, it's not a new field uh, by any means. Um, the pharmaceutical industry adopted hydrogenation uh, into its processes uh, even as early as the 60s. Um, and the reason why it's persisted and continues to grow is because uh, taking a survey of a lot of the small molecule APIs, you'll see that there are chiral centers uh, within the molecule. And doing hydrogenation uh, actually is, is one of the most uh, prominent methods for setting that chiral center. Um, there are a lot of catalysts that have been used in the area uh, with different types of metals, but the most prominent ones are roth ruthenium and, and rhodium. Um, and actually, the reaction is, is so important that it was uh, recognized with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2001. Um, at the bottom of the slide here, I provided one of the most well-known applications uh, for asymmetric hydrogenation, which is actually the use of Noyori's catalyst um, for Takasago's production of menthol. If we pull an example, a more recent example in the literature for hydrogenation or API synthesis, uh, one of the examples that I found uh, worth pointing out is actually the multi-ton synthesis uh, from Merkin Co. for Genuvia, which is a treatment for type um, you can see here, actually, uh, the only transformation that we're incurring is to take this unsaturated bond and to add two hydrogens so that you can set this chiral center here. And in fact, uh, this reaction uh, has several iter iterations, and uh, even at the optimized stage, uh, their original synthesis uh, provided 98% yield and 95% EE. Uh, but once they uh, go through a recrystallization process, you're actually able to boost the enantiomeric excess up to 99.9%. Moving on from hydrogenation, uh, the next main type of catalyst uh, reaction in API synthesis uh, would probably be carbon-carbon cross-coupling. And in this case, um, you're creating a carbon-carbon bond um, essentially from two different coupling parts, one that would be considered a carbon nucleophile and another compound uh, in which you can consider the carbon electrophile, which in situ uh, is generated into a metal complex of some sort. Uh, and so you can see here, this is kind of the generic mechanism for uh, one of the types of carbon-carbon cross-coupling called the Suzuki-Miura cross-coupling. And uh, what differentiates a Kumada from a Sonogashira from a uh, Suzuki-Miura is simply the identity of this uh, electrophilic carbon cross-coupling partner. And so uh, by changing from, say, a Grignard reagent to a lithium reagent uh, to a boron-containing reagent, uh, you're simply going through and identifying which of the carbon-carbon cross-couplings you're actually looking at. But they all share essentially the same mechanism. So this is um, has, has grown in terms of uh, its uh, usage in MedChem in a dramatic fashion. Um, before 1984, this essentially was an unknown reaction. And as of 2014, it's probably the second most used uh, catalytic reaction uh, for MedChem. And its use, once again, um, is very important uh, inside and outside of API synthesis and actually was um, recognized uh, for its usefulness and versatility in 2010 uh, for a Nobel Prize. Um, surveying the different methods that are available, there's lots of different, once again, there's lots of different metals that can be applied for carbon-carbon cross-coupling. Um, but if we look at the actual methods that are applied for API synthesis and eventually for process and production, palladium stands out as a uh, key metal uh, uh, used for the different uh, catalytic systems as well as pre-catalysts uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. A closer related type of reaction uh, is the carbon heteroatom cross-coupling. Um, in this case, as you can imagine, the only difference is instead of the carbon uh, nucleophile that you're using, you're gonna replace it with a nucleophile that has some type of 
heteroatom, in this case, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, uh, fluorine, boron. These are the most common types of heteroatoms that are applied for these types of reactions. Uh, the mechanism that is shown below the definition here is actually the mechanism for the carbon-nitrogen bond formation, which is actually called the Buchwald-Hartwig reaction. Um, this was actually introduced in 1995 um, independently from the groups of Stephen Buchwald and John Hartwig and uh, has developed into a top 20 uh, reaction overall for MedChem and probably a top uh, five reaction uh, more recently. In terms of why it's, it's grown to such prominence, um, you can actually see uh, this if you survey kind of the top 200 drugs or even a lot of the natural products that are found um, that end up having some type of therapeutic uh, or therapeutic uh, action. And you can see that a lot of compounds um, have this carbon nitrogen scaffold in there. Uh, and forming that bond previously was very challenging. Um, probably the most well-known method to do this previously was through an SNAR reaction, which is typically run at very high heat in very uh, harsh conditions. And so the Buchwald-Hartwig and other carbon heteroatom cross-coupling reactions uh, were able to provide much milder conditions and expand the type of cross-coupling partners you could have because your conditions were much more amenable to sensitive uh, functional groups. Uh, once again, palladium stands out uh, both for the carbon-carbon and for the carbon-heteroatom uh, cross-coupling reactions. So as an example, um, to kind of showcase both carbon-heteroatom and carbon-carbon cross-coupling, uh, I've chosen the example here from Eli Lilly um, in which they performed a multi-kilogram synthesis of a hypertension drug, um, LY2623091. Um, in this case, uh, there are two steps, uh, subsequent steps. Uh, the first step is the conversion of this uh, alkene with the bromide converted to uh, this uh, carbon bromine bond. And that is called the Miura borrelation. Uh, that would be an example of a carbon heteroatom cross coupling here. Once again, you're using palladium as your metal source. And then shifting into uh, the use of that product is then uh, converted uh, to a carbon-carbon bond formation uh, between the carbon on this aryl halide and this uh, uh, carbon-boron bond to generate this CC bond here. And that is using, once again, uh, a different palladium source and a different ligand system, but uh, generally uh, we're using palladium catalysis uh, with some sort of phosphine or uh, NHC ligand to um, provide an efficient conversion of two coupling partners into one coupling partner. So moving on from uh, hydrogenation and cross-coupling, we reach metathesis. Uh, in this case, metathesis is defined generally as uh, taking two hydrocarbons and converting it into a new hydrocarbon um, in which a, a single double or triple bond is exchanged and you generate uh, two molecules. And so uh, just as an example, I provided a mechanism for the ring closing metathesis variation. Um, there are actually various uh, versions of metathesis that are known, uh, but the two most common in API synthesis uh, and in MedChem would be ring closing metathesis and cross. Um, you might notice a theme here. Once again, this reaction is uh, very versatile, uh, very, um, well uh, known for uh, applications uh, for very challenging transformations. And so this was also awarded Nobel Prize uh, in 2005. Um, in this case, uh, instead of palladium being the main focus, ruthenium has found its way uh, to be the most prominent metal to be used in these processes. Um, and if we take a comparison between metathesis, hydrogenation, and cross coupling, um, it is uh, leagues apart in terms of how frequently and the quantity in which metathesis is um, used compared to the other two um, types of catalysis. But there is a good reason for that, and it really comes down to the fact that there's still a lot of patent protection um, that hinders the more broad usage and larger scale uses of these uh, metathesis catalysts. 
And it's my belief, and based on a lot of the indications we have uh, within the business development side, is that once those patent protections start to lapse, um, the number of instances where metathesis is applied to API synthesis will dramatically increase. So for an example of uh, ring closing metathesis within API synthesis, uh, what I've chosen here is GSK's synthesis for SP, SB462795. Um, this was actually a, a very promising uh, API candidate and was at the time um, before uh, it was shut down uh, because of undesired drug-drug uh, interactions with more uh, well-known, um, and some of the more well-known and established uh, drugs out there. Um, it was already being produced at 200 kilograms. Um, you can see here the ring closing metathesis is a key step to forming uh, the core of this um, API candidate. Um, it was actually the third iteration that you're seeing here um, in which uh, earlier generations needed to protect this alcohol. And this ended up being the best iteration that they were to come up with. And unfortunately, um, it just happened to fail in terms of safety for phase one, but would have been a very uh, great addition to the number of, uh, or the list of drugs uh, that are currently uh, used for the treatment of osteoporosis. So, I would say that those areas that I've mentioned, uh, cross-coupling, uh, asymmetric catalysis, uh, metathesis, um, and hydrogenation, those are the main types of catalyst areas in MedChem that, that most people are aware of and ones that have established themselves over the last uh, 50, 60 years and will continue to be the major types of catalyst uh, and catalytic uh, reactions used for MedChem. But there are certainly a number of emerging catalyst areas that are starting to gain more prominence and more quickly uh, than, than uh, some of the reactions from the past. And this has a lot to do with the fact that uh, when we go back and look at some of the reactions that have dominated the field of medicinal chemistry, um, such as the Suzuki Mira coupling, it generates a very specific type of molecule, specifically biphenyl type molecules. And so, it's great for doing this in a very effective manner, uh, but the issue that you run into is that you start to generate a chemical space that is very concentrated. And so a lot of the effort that I've seen in the last five to 10 years has been expanding chemical space and particularly finding new catalytic methods um, to adopt into MedChem to replace some of the older methods so that you can broaden the diversity of your API candidates by broadening the types of chemical space uh, occupied by the API candidates. And so uh, I'll talk about a few of those areas in this next section. And those areas will still continue to include hydrogenation and cross-coupling, uh, but some of the new areas um, that I will touch upon include oxidation, CH activation insertion, and uh, one of the areas that is uh, most uh, dear and close to me, uh, photoredox catalysis and metallophotoredox catalysis. So in terms of CH activation, um, this is a very new area in terms of uh, direct application to API and, and hopefully for uh, larger scale and bulk reactions for API synthesis. Um, however, it's recognized very early on. Um, if we take into account that uh, CH bonds are one of the most prominent bonds, most one of the most uh, frequent bonds you'll find in organic molecules. Um, but the challenge here is that they're extremely inert, um, they're strong, and they have low polarity. And so even within the same molecule where you have different types of CH bonds, whether they're SPCH, SP2CH, SP3CH bonds, it's going to be challenging to differentiate between all those different types uh, because they have very similar bond association and the environment uh, of the molecule is very important for selectively choosing which of those CH bonds reacts. Uh, but this challenge has been approached in many different ways, and hopefully I'll be able to provide uh, kind of a insight into one of those applications and uh, kind of raise some interest into this area so that we 
do see a, a large development into CH activation in the future. So the example that I've chosen here is for um, a molecule, um, and actually this, this strategy has been used for a whole class of molecules that are considered angiotensin II receptor blockers, ARBs. Um, a, a variety of ARBs have been synthesized um, from, from API Corporation, not at a very large scale, um, around 100 gram, uh, a little bit lower, a little bit greater for some of the different analogs. Uh, but this synthesis actually is very fascinating uh, because one of the components of the ARB molecule uh, is actually the portion of the molecule responsible for directing where that CH bond is activated. And so you can see here, uh, this is overall a carbon-carbon cross-coupling. Uh, but it's different from the carbon-carbon cross-coupling that I presented earlier because the CH, the bond that you're cross-coupling with is a CH bond, which is not activated and doesn't necessarily differentiate itself from any other CH bond on uh, the aryl group here. Um, so how does that differentiation occur? It really comes down to uh, the use of the metal and the activation for the nearest proximal uh, CH bond, and that happens to be this ortho CH bond here when activated, can bring together this aryl halide at this carbon and attach at this carbon here. And it's shown that uh, every component is um, extremely important for not only the yield, but selectivity. Um, and as I mentioned, this strategy was used for a variety of different analogs um, that API Corporation was able to generate. Another area of, of growing importance within catalysis is not necessarily a catalyst area, it's more of a catalyst type. And in this case, um, I'm referring to palladium precatalyst. Um, so just to kind of refer back to some of the previous um, conditions where we had palladium cross-coupling, I'll just go here quickly. You'll see that there's some palladium source, um, some phosphine ligand, and then other additives and reagents that make this reaction possible. What you'll notice here though, is that in order for this process to take place effectively, um, what you're hoping for is that the palladium acetate source and that ligand interact effectively in situ. There's some active species being generated in situ, uh, but based on all of our mechanistic understanding for palladium catalysis, a lot can happen uh, within that uh, process to generate that palladium zero active catalyst species. Uh, you can get catalyst deactivation, you can get metal deactivation, uh, you can also generate a variety of different uh, catalyst species, some which can be reversibly converted into the active species and some that become non-active species. And so in order to address kind of these issues with generating the active species, uh, a number of groups wanted to see if they could provide palladium precatalyst systems. And the most common, and I think uh, the, one of the most popular um, precatalysts that are known in the industry uh, and in academia are the Buckwald precatalysts. Um, as you can see here, there are many generations that have been um, uh, developed throughout the years. And the most recent example are these palladium G6 precatalysts. Uh, which hopefully I'll have time to explain at the end of the presentation. Uh, but with each of these uh, generations, uh, you essentially need to undergo an activation of some sort and the generation of some throwaway portion, uh, which in situ generates your active catalyst. But the one thing that you don't need to worry about is being able to have your palladium source find your ligand that is responsible for generating this active species because that pre-association um, exists at the very, very beginning. So other requirements for palladium precatalysts um, that have become uh, more and more important uh, within the development of these types of compounds is that they need to be easy to work with. Um, a lot of the palladium sources early on for palladium catalysis were very air sensitive or moisture sensitive. Um, so it wasn't just a goal to make something that could effectively 
uh, generate your active species. It had to be something that could also be used more easily by medicinal chemists and eventually process chemists. And so stability, um, uh, sensitivity for functional groups and the ability to uh, be used with a diverse number of ligands uh, were other important features that needed to be um, prominent or needed to be exhibited by any um, successful pre-catalyst. And so some of the most successful pre-catalysts um, are shown here. One, the Buckwell pre-catalyst. There are six generations, as I mentioned. Uh, Pepsi catalysts, which were uh, discovered and developed by Michael Oregon's group. And then these Pi Al pre-catalysts, which are actually proprietary catalysts from Johnson Matthey, uh, developed by um, some of the early work from Thomas Colicott and uh, Shanagasi. So one application, and, and actually there aren't that many applications uh, that you'll find for very large scale uh, synthesis using pre-catalysts because uh, they're such a new type of technology within the cross-coupling area. Uh, but there are a few, um, and one of the ones that I was able to find here uh, is the use of a second generation Buckwall pre-catalyst um, in which XFOS, the ligand, is pre-ligated to palladium um, and then generated uh, and generates the active species in situ um, with the use of a very weak base under very mild conditions. Um, it should be noted here that when the reaction was uh, carried out or was attempted uh, with using XFOS and any palladium source, palladium acetate, palladium chloride, palladium DBA, the reaction was not as effective. And so this kind of highlights um, where the pre really shine is when, the, when you have trouble doing a typical traditional approach to cross-coupling, um, I think the first solution would be to see if the pre version, although everything is pretty much the same on paper, uh, might have a much more dramatic effect for the efficiency of the reaction. Another uh, that's emerging within uh, catalysis uh, is non use of non-precious metal catalysts. Um, and so for the most part, all of the examples that I have shown previously, whether it's the use of palladium, uh, ruthenium, rhodium, these are all expensive, uh, low quantity, um, and, and difficult to work with in some cases, metals. But uh, there's been a shift, uh, I think, uh, within academia as well as in industry to want to focus and, and adopt more of these non-precious metal catalysts um, that comes from uh, this list here. And, and particularly, there's a lot of focus in iron and nickel catalysts. Um, and some of these catalysts actually have been brought into the Merck uh, catalog and uh, are very new, but are showing very strong sales and uh, very strong interest um, throughout uh, the different regions, as well as uh, industry and academia. One of the examples I found actually for uh, use of a non-precious metal was uh, particularly an iron uh, Kumata coupling here. Uh, we're doing a carbon SP2, carbon SP3 cross coupling. Uh, this is kind of a more exotic type of carbon-carbon cross coupling. Most of the carbon cross couplings you'll find are SP2, SP2. Uh, but as I mentioned, because one of the goals for API synthesis for the near future is to uh, increase the chemical space uh, that is covered by API candidates, uh, changing the types of uh, hybridizations for your carbon cross-coupling is one way to achieve this. And so one example from Dr. Reedy's labs uh, is actually a multi-kilogram synthesis um, for this, this drug with the name Aliskirin, uh, which is used to treat hypertension. Um, and they were able to effectively use a very cheap iron source, iron ACAC, um, at very low catalyst loadings uh, because uh, non-precious metals typically have very high catalyst loadings compared to their precious metal uh, variants. Uh, and, and lowering the catalyst loading down to uh, less than two more percent is actually uh, a pretty impressive achievement here uh, for this type of cross-coupling. Moving from uh, the non-precious metals, uh, we now reach uh, one area that is I would say one of the most uh, recent developments um, for 
catalytic transformations in general, but also a lot of promise in API synthesis, and that's photoredox and metallophotoredox uh, chemistry. And so for those who are not familiar with this area, essentially uh, we want to take molecules um, and compounds that are uh, activated via the electromagnetic spectrum um, and this can range um, it, throughout the throughout the the wavelength uh, range, but our main focus is on visible light so that we can provide the most um, mild reaction conditions um, and and also allow for the most broad type of substrates uh, for the coupling to take place. And the early research um, was actually as far back as the 70s and 80s, but kind of disappeared for a while um, and returned in the late 2000s um, with the work from Macmillan and Yoon and Stevenson uh, for the actual application of photoredox catalysis toward organic synthesis. Um, and then slowly it's been uh, developed with more and more focus on how these can come, these can convert from academic curiosities to actual applications in medicinal chemistry. And along with that development, has been uh, kind of the birth of a new area called metallophotoredox. Um, and this area is very fascinating because it actually combines uh, some of the traditional cross coupling uh, with some of the new developments for photoredox uh, so that you have two active catalysts working synergistically. Um, in this case, nickel catalysis is normally the, uh, the partner catalyst with the photocatalyst being used. Uh, but if we then, if we focus in on just the photocatalyst part here, um, throughout the last 20, uh, 25 years, um, what used to be focused only on iridium and ruthenium uh, photocatalyst has actually expanded um, dramatically into non-precious metals as well as organic versions of photocatalyst. And I see this area continually to grow, um, and and I don't doubt that uh, at some point there will be a significant use of photocatalysts within API synthesis. Um, and so there are a few examples in which uh, total synthesis has been performed using photocatalysts or metallophotoredox catalysis. But for this last example, in terms of emerging chemistry, I'm actually going to talk about a different application for photoredox catalysis. And that's actually for uh, the application for lignin depolymerization. Um, the reason why this is such a important uh, application or potential application for photoredox is that um, we are looking at a very good source for polyaromatic and, and aromatic molecules coming from a very uh, abundant biomass source, in this case, plant cells. Uh, and you can convert and cleave these bonds to generate different types of aromatic uh, uh, variants of compounds that would be considered commodity compounds. And as I mentioned before, commodity compounds eventually feeds into fine chemicals and then fine chemicals with the help of specialty chemicals like catalysts will then feed into API synthesis. So we're taking a few steps back, um, but the application uh, and the development of photoredox for lignin depolymerization has actually had a lot of uh, potential uh, advancements that will be useful for API synthesis. And so the first thing to point out is um, just a few years ago, uh, what they found was that they could completely uh, remove the use of metals and rely completely on organic photocatalysts to um, have this transformation take place. Another thing they found was that they could uh, polymerize these two types of photocatalysts together into molecules where the ratios between the DCB and the uh, four CZIPN molecule uh, had different uh, ratios so that it can afford different types of transformations. Uh, the other benefit from actually forming this polymerization was that these could be recyclable. And so just as a show, just to showcase kind of uh, those uh, benefits that I have mentioned, uh, we have here uh, the model system for a lignin linkage, a beta O4 linkage, that is first oxidized uh, with one version of this polymer in which you have 100 percent receptor molecule. And then if you use a, uh, a different variation of the polymer where you have only 33 percent 
of this acceptor molecule versus 67% uh, of the donor molecule, uh, then you can convert the usage of that polymer from an oxidant to a reductant to cleave the CO bond. And so the reason I wanted to highlight this example of photoredox catalysis for API synthesis is by, I believe that a lot of the development here where you have a very versatile catalyst design, you have uh, use of only organic molecules and the use of something that is recyclable and has been shown to be recyclable effectively over various uh, timeframes and for uh, a series of uh, recyclability studies uh, has a lot of impact and potential uh, applications for API synthesis. Now, um, I think we are coming to our poll question two, and I'll provide, I think, another minute or so for uh, incoming responses, and then we'll move on to the last portion of the seminar. And Jenny, you can uh, you can let me know when uh, when I should move forward. Yes, please continue, John. Thank you. Great. All right, I see a lot of interest in photoredox and metallophotoredox chemistry, so that's that's a good sign. Um, so for the last part, um, I wanted to introduce uh, what we can provide at Merck um, beyond the obvious uh, applications and the obvious uh, catalog products. Uh, for catalysis. So first of all, uh, a lot of effort in the last few years has been focused on uh, bringing some of the focus and emerging photo, photo, uh, the emerging catalyst classes from just catalog sales where we're selling things in milligrams to gram quantities uh, to be able to provide our customers with uh, kilograms and, and in some cases tons of uh, certain catalysts in certain catalyst class. And so uh, the areas that we are most uh, proficient in are listed here. These are the six areas that we have been able to provide bulk quantities of catalysts, whether it be for a dozen or maybe just a few of the products within each of those classes. And in the last couple of years, uh, we've actually uh, recognized um, emerging products uh, with emerging uh, demand, and we are working on making sure that we add these emerging products into the growing list of what we consider bulk catalysts. Um, but we obviously always rely on customer feedback to let us know uh, what is the expectation for the future. You know, we have our own metrics and we have our own ways of predicting what are the areas that will become bulk demand in the future. Uh, but uh, usually uh, our best resource is customers. And so we, we look to customers, we look to academia uh, to give us an idea of where catalysis is moving. And it's not always obvious. And sometimes uh, things can change even within a year uh, of things that are bought only on the catalog scale, the things that are bought at the bulk scale. So beyond just the, the products themselves, um, Merck prides itself on being able to uh, provide support in all different manners uh, to not only our products, but specifically to our catalyst areas. Um, so one area that we uh, are developing um, our resources is in the area of brochures. To make it easier for our customers to know uh, what types of catalysts there are. Sure that if you visit our website, you can actually quickly type in catalyst or any of the catalyst classes I mentioned before and find a very large listing. Sometimes uh, it's a double-edged sword though because our listing and offering is so large, it's hard to navigate which catalyst and which catalyst types um, you are actually looking for. And so one place I would start with and I would definitely recommend looking into is our catalyst from bench to bulk uh, brochure. This breaks our catalyst areas down into metal types and application types and also gives, uh, for the most part, a comprehensive listing of our uh, catalyst offering. Uh, beyond just our uh, listing of products, we also provide support literature 
And in this case, this comes in the form of user guides and uh, application guides, uh, which have been developed in-house by some of our experts. Uh, but also some of these have been uh, developed with the work of uh, external key opinion leaders, including the Macmillan Group uh, and the Shevitz Group for our photo redox analysis guide. Uh, we've worked with uh, Grubs for the Olefin Metathesis Guide, and we've worked with uh, groups um, that are prominent in CH activation, like uh, Jin Kwan Yu, um, and, and, and other prominent groups like the Barron Group for development of our uh, CH functionalization reaction manual. And then um, beyond just the literature, we've also provided uh, specific reactors um, that have been developed in conjunction with partners, um, where we have certain reactors that will help for uh, both the screening and optimization process for photoredox reactions. And then if you're looking for a broader type of screening kit, uh, we have screening kits for pretty much every major focus catalyst area, ranging from uh, cross-coupling to metathesis, uh, to even just screening the bases used for these types of uh, reactions. And so hopefully what I've been able to um, highlight here is that for every stage of API synthesis within drug development, uh, Merck has had uh, a goal of trying to provide the best we can from library synthesis all the way to manufacturing. Um, primarily, we wanted to introduce the broadest thing um, that is out there, and then to kind of hone in and look at which of those catalyst areas needed further support with support literature, and which of those catalyst areas uh, our customers needed in kilogram or multi-ton scale so that we could provide uh, the same customer looking at a small scale synthesis all the way to bulk synthesis. And for the last few slides, what I'd like to do is introduce um, a, a project that I've been working on uh, since I was a postdoc in the Buckwald Group. And this is uh, the development of a comprehensive catalysis application guide. Um, so as you saw from the previous slides, we have application guides and we have uh, certain brochures in specific areas. Uh, but the core goal um, is to develop a web version or IPDF version of a comprehensive application guide that covers all the main callus areas and will become an evergreen project so that we continually develop. Uh, as new developments and new callus come out, we can update this application guide to keep it relevant uh, for the future. Um, and so I have been working on developing the basic format and the basic skeletal structure for this application guide. And because I worked in the Buckwald group, um, I, the starting point that I chose was the Buckwald ligands, Buckwald precatalysts, and other phosphine ligands to do cross-coupling, both carbon-carbon cross-coupling and carbon-heteroatom cross-coupling. Um, so that may seem like a niche and small area, uh, but just to give you kind of a uh, survey of the applications of known uh, Buckwald ligands. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of Buckwald ligands in which some ligands are better for certain applications like CN cross-coupling and other ligands are better for carbon-carbon cross-coupling. And simply by looking at this list, um, it would be challenging for anyone that doesn't have a well-versed uh, background in catalysis, especially cross-coupling, to pick out the ligand uh, that would be best suited for that certain application. And so the goal was, to kind of take all that we've done in the past in terms of developing application guides and also for um, these uh, catalyst brochures and to bring it into one combined resource, um, starting with the Buckwald cross-coupling, uh, Buckwald uh, applications for cross-coupling. And so eventually uh, you could have any reaction and be able to refer to this guide and hopefully have a good starting point for uh, how to uh, get this reaction to work. And so as an example, um, I provided this model type of transformation here. Uh, if a grad student or med, med chemist or process chemist uh, were given this cross coupling and asked, you know, where would be the best starting point? Um, I hope that the guide could provide 
kind of direction for that. And so uh, how I envision that is through the uh, following path. Uh, what you would encounter in this guide would be first a table um, listing the major types of reactions uh, in MedChem. Uh, and this will be obviously expanded as we, as we increase the content um, that this guide will cover. But in this case, what we have here is a identification that you want to form this carbon nitrogen bond. And so using the table that's presented, you can go to that specific cell and click on that cell, and that should provide to you a more expanded table. This expanded table will then cover, for the most part, what is known uh, for the different types of carbon nitrogen cross coupling. What uh, nitrogen cross coupling partners have been used and what type of carbon electrophiles have been used to bring together that CN bond. In this case, um, going back to our reaction, we can then um, narrow down which of these uh, nitrogen nucleophiles and which of the carbon electrophiles we're actually using. So in this case, we see we have a primary amine that will bring us to this section of the Callus guide. And here we have an aryl chloride and specifically a heteroaryl chloride because this is a pyridine. Um, and so if we look here, we have this six membered heteroaryl chloride combining with some sort of primary amine. And so our starting point conditions will probably be in this two columns here. Um, the primary amines actually uh, can then further be broken down into uh, two different areas. And one area is unhindered versus alpha branching. And in this case, uh, it's obvious we have a unhindered primary amine. And so with all that information given from just the two coupling partners, we can then hone into uh, the fact that our two catalysts that are best to start with are BRETFOS and GFOS. And if we click that cell, it will then bring us to a more detailed page that provides information for what reference to look for, uh, to see the full methodology, uh, what are the best conditions in terms of solvent-based temperature, and certain troubleshooting notes that will help guide the screening and optimization process. And so this is still at a development stage and is still being uh, populated with the information that's currently available, uh, but hopefully it will allow for any chemist with any type of background to quickly get acquainted with the different areas of catalysis. And so with that, um, I want to just summarize kind of the uh, goal of the presentation. Hopefully I was, I was able to drive uh, three different messages. One is that catalysis is extremely important for modern society. Uh, specifically within uh, modern society, uh, the life sciences chemical space and catalysis for drug development is uh, intimately tied together. And for the drug development process to benefit from catalysis for the future, um, it's going to require new catalytic methods to be developed and optimized so that we can expand into more uh, and, and broader API chemical space. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any further questions, I'll try to answer whatever I can uh, here in the, uh, in the seminar. Uh, but also if you have any questions that aren't answered, uh, please reach out to Jenny or to me, um, and we'll hopefully be able to follow up uh, with an answer. That's great. Thank you very much, John. Uh, a very comprehensive presentation, uh, especially to be able to fit all that information in one hour and with some great insights into the emerging catalysts. And I really love the helpful Aldridge um, Catalysis Application Guide. So please reach out if you'd like a copy of that, or you could just email me directly. I've put my, put my email in the chat, and also you can see there on the slide, Jenny McShane at Merck Group. Now, while we're chatting, uh, please put any of your questions in the chat. Uh, if you're a little bit shy, no problems, you can also contact myself or John directly. John also invites anyone, if you want further details or meeting or virtual meeting and go more comprehensively into any of these reactions, the invitation is there for you. So now we do have a question in the chat. Donna, here we go. We have a porous carbon-based uh, polymeric material. 
We are looking for potential application of the system in catalysis. Can you help? I, I'm sure that I can once once I once I get a little bit more information. Um, I, it, I I want to I want to say that absolutely um, we have lots of, like as I mentioned we have one of the most comprehensive uh, catalyst offerings. But I mentioned and probably uh, should have mentioned was we have an R and D department that is specifically focused on developing novel um, and uh, derivatives of known catalysts. And so if there's any indication um, of something that may work already for your system, um, we can talk about it and uh, provide, if you can provide a little more details, we can work internally to come up with solutions that may be commercially available or ones that may need development um, from, from the R&D step all the way uh, up to production. So um, preliminary answer, yes. Uh, if I can get more information, I can definitely provide uh, more in-depth uh, answers for that. Great. Thank you, John. We'll definitely reach out. Um, yeah, much appreciated. And thank you, everybody, with the uh, polls. And it looks like the areas of advancement people are very keen on is the developing recyclable tablets and mm -hmm. also the technology advancement, so especially flow chemistry. So that was very interesting. So we'll be definitely looking into that. And also we could see with the second question, the type of catalysis most interested in, a uh, very strong result, 100% uh, actually, with uh, photoredox and metallo uh, photoredox. Uh, very interest there. So again, please reach out if you'd like more information from us or further training uh, with John, uh, we're about, we're here for you. So yeah, and just, just, to, just to mention as, a, as an addition to what Jenny was saying, um, I, I've actually worked on a photo catalyst and Motella Photoredox presentation with our product manager. Um, it's about 15 uh, to 25 minutes long, depending on what slides we end up including. Um, but we can we can you know stretch that and add more detail. Uh, but there's actually been a lot of new developments uh, for the applications of photoredox and metallophoto for API synthesis that I didn't mention today, um, and that that have a lot of impact uh, for the future. Absolutely. Well, and there's no more questions in the chat today, so I'd just like to say uh, again, thank you very much, uh, John, uh, for today. The presentation was amazing. Thank you very much for all our attendees. Uh, please do reach out if, directly if you have any questions or need further support. So thank you everyone and I will stop the recording and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Bye thank everybody. you everyone. Sunny.